we are very, and I'm going to stop sharing. We are very excited because today um, we're going to revisit a conversation that we started having when we were building um, the starts of the customer success module. So as we talk about customer success, we talk about segmenting your client base. We talk about, you know, including customer health. Uh, and then getting insights into opportunities. And we um, knew the other piece was to really talk about goal setting for clients. Uh, and it's something, the nice thing about this conversation is that it can be done as part of the, Q, it is done as part of the QBR. So in the VCIO tool, right, you're aligning goals to that. We have the tracking piece in the customer success module. Um, but what was most interesting about the conversation is that Matt and Greg and Tricia, who are on this call, um, were having conversations about their best practices. And then um, I think I think there was some like, ooh, I, I want to hear more about what you do. I want to hear more about what you do. Um, and, and Alex and I both agreed to all of that because one, we can build better functionality if we know what everybody's doing. But also, we like to steal your best practices and share them with other people. So we asked for their permission to come chat. There's um, transparency for you. I therefore yeah. then give myself permission to steal it and go, uh, go talk to other people about it. So for those of you who have joined this call before, I am sure you've seen these, heard these voices at least and seen some of the faces. Um, we have a Greg and Matt from, so it's Greg Webb and Matt Claren from Hungerford. Um, and then we have Trisha King from Vertical 6. And I would love, like Matt and Greg, if you could give a quick overview of, um, you know, what brings you to the party. And then I'll pass over to Trisha and then we can start the conversation around goals. Sure. Do you mean what brings us today or what do we do in our jobs? That well, are I would love an overview of where you are, what you're, so everybody's going to immediately worry, like, do I have to compete against these people? Because, wow, look <laughs> at what they're doing. And so maybe you should tell them your niche in your area <laughs> to yeah. start. Uh, and then yeah, what brings us here today too. We're going to sound super impressive because we have the microphone. So it makes you sound better, but it's, it's I think, my trick, man. yeah, <laughs> I think Trisha and I have talked enough times. We're both kind of like, you know, at any given time, we're 10% of the way to the goal of what we really want to be. And we're always trying to improve that. And I, I've liked working with Trisha specifically because both of us kind of have that approach of this is how we're doing it. And we're trying to be better and it doesn't have to be a, this is the right way or the wrong way. Uh, so uh, background on me, I've been in IT since I graduated college. I've been IT for about 10 years now. And uh, my role with our company is that uh, VCIO role. We call it a business advisor. And I would say we are pretty average for what I see competing in the market. We're in West Michigan and we focus like most MSPs within an hour drive and in that uh, 25 to 150 employee range uh, for our customer base. And we are 30 employees and getting to the point where we need to rely on process more than just needing to throw stuff across the fence and hope people can catch what we throw. And so we're, we're bumping into a lot of this more. And it's been really nice to talk to Tricia because they're a bit uh, larger and they've been relying on process longer. So I, I'm showing your hand, Tricia, sorry, but I, I think it's interesting <laughs> to see us who are like right bumping into this now and you who've been doing it for a little while. And that's what's been fun for me talking with you is that contrast. Thank you. Before we Toss it to Tricia, I'll introduce myself, Matt, and I've also been in the IT services my career. And most of this call, I'll probably be quiet because my main job here is to be devil's advocate with Greg. Greg comes up with all the good ideas in our company and I just, uh, I, I tell him why it doesn't work even when I agree with him half the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you don't have to enlarge the door frame should he come in the office and you have to wedge the head in there, right? I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, right, Trisha. I am Trisha King. Um, I've been in IT one way or another for over 25 years now. Um, uh, we work, uh, we're located in Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island's small enough. We don't really have a north, south, east, or west. It's just Rhode Island. <laughs> so we do cover most of the um, southern New England area, um, you know, and we do have a few customers here and there outside of that branch offices and things of that nature. Perfect. So Greg, did you want me to kick off with questions or did you have a hot one you wanted to start Trisha with? <laughs> <laughs> I have a really impressive slide deck ready. Can I share my screen? We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Don't, don't go like showing it. up our jam board. <laughs> All right. That's what I was going to say. Is that Arial or Cambria font? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, the, it's the Google approach. The simplicity took a lot of work to get to this. <laughs> uh, no, so it's just uh, two slides. Um, the goal that we were going to run through today was Trisha would talk about goals and examples of how they go through that. And then I'm going to talk about a wish list approach that we go through, which is similar but different. And then we were just going to open it up to discussion. That's the plan. Fantastic. So this is how we present organizational and technology goals in all of our business reviews. So we really try to focus on um, business itself. So, you know, provide improved reporting, easier integrations, better workflows in the different departments. This is something that our customers can understand. Um, you know, we only have uh, a, a group of uh, customers that really have a strong IT uh, staff. And so for the most part, they don't understand technical, but this they understand. And then we kind of walk through and we talk to them about um, how technology is actually going to align with that. So as far as expanding offerings into other areas, you know, love to toot my own horn and say, you know what, we've done a really great job with you. We've put you up into the cloud right now. All your applications are there. You're, you're, you can open up offices wherever. You, the only thing that you want to keep in mind is when you open that office, there are equipment shortages right now so as soon as you know about it we need to know about it so we can plan that for you and uh, and this is probably the first conversation that we have in our business review we want to um, talk to them about uh, is this still the um, valid for you and what's changed since the last time we spoke and we spend time on this and what's nice with this is you're working with recommendations you can show them how those recommendations align up into those goals. So I don't know, um, Greg, do you wanna take them through the wish list? Yeah, I think just this first blush is a good, let's get through this part quick. So um, as a uh, more mature practice, you've got a lot of experience going through that very formal concise language. I'll just point out, it felt like maybe a silly, but a, an epiphany for me, how simple it was. We do lip service. I want to know what your strategic goals are, Mr. Customer. And then the whole point of my job is try to make sure that we're aligned to that goal. And then you pulled up this three column table and I just shook my head like, why aren't we just making it a simple table that says, <laughs> you said this is your goal and these are the things we're doing. It's it's stupid simple, but it's very powerful. And I've started imitating this already. So um, pat on the back there. Well, and the other thing that I thought you kind of highlighted, every time I've thought about this, I always was struggling to find, well, what is the goal that we're working on or what's the project we're working on to help you achieve it? And that you, as you pointed out, isn't necessary every time. It's also tooting your own horn of, you are set up from a technology standpoint to do this. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, came up on the call last week. The uh, sorry, this letter was so long. If I had had more time, it would have been shorter. It's this is the this is the I took the time and had the ability to make a concise version. Mine is the more longer one, but I think it deserves to exist outside of goals, and that's why it's survived. As Trisha and I have been interrogating each other about how these things work. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've actually stolen some of this from uh, from Greg too. That's why everybody's <laughs> here today. I'm confident of it. <laughs> yeah, this uh, we were talking about it. Felt this is this is friendlier. It's not this stuffy. What are your organizational goals? You know, a five person company may not actually ever sit down and write those down. So this is the first time they've ever even had to try to articulate our company goals. Is when I'm sitting across from them, like, all right, I'm your advisor now. Let's talk. What are your goals? That's a very hard question to ask. And I was joking with Tricia too. A lot of times the hardest part of my job during this part is asking a tough question and then staying silent for more mm -hmm. than half a second mm -hmm. to let them put together an answer. And I mean, that would be advice I would give is struggle through it with them because I've gotten a ton of value out of this. The first three, I wrote down a title. Whoops, I clicked a title when they told me it and then tried to put a description down. And then I was scared to ask, can you just like, put it into a sentence, what is the problem you're solving and get them to 
say it because them saying it is the point of this, not me saying it, which is an important detail there. Um, and then getting them to commit to something about urgency. And then it's also like, I, I didn't want to create eight different date fields because there could be the date we need a decision by, there could be the date we have to spend money on something next by, the date we need to be done by, the date, like there's all these potential things. I just ask them now, is there any important date you're already tracking that we can be aware of as we go through this? Um, and then that estimated cost field is mostly blank but there's a meaningful step where in front of your client, you both agree that there isn't a price yet that we know what this costs. Uh, it's more valuable if you can ask them, what do you think this is going to cost and start there? It helps I, narrow in. I have a question for you about this because I can imagine myself having this conversation with a customer and the blank stare that's going to come back, back across the table. Is there something you do to prepare for this? Do you send them anything ahead of time to let them start putting thoughts together? Is that something you've ever thought about? Do you think that would take away from some of the value of sitting there and hashing it out at the table? We've only been doing this for about eight months, so it's still pretty young. Uh, I imagine a survey ahead of time would be helpful, but I also think you do it the first time and then they're in the mode of understanding. And then the next time you bring it up, they get a little bit better at thinking the way I need them to think. I think for us with the organizational goals, we set it up during the onboarding process so when we have our, our kickoff on the onboarding, we let them know that they're going to have a conversation with me. Um, and the, this is to understand what it is that they're doing with the business long-term, because if we don't understand what's happening with the business, we can't make good technology recommendations. And um, so it's not going to be a technology conversation. It's gonna be more of a business focused uh, conversation. So when I did this for school systems, I would often just cyber stalk their website. Now school systems are required to publish their school improvement plans. So that makes mm -hmm. it very easy, right? They're going to put some numbers right on there that we could track toward. But I do think you can get some interesting takes. Maybe if it's a new business or a small business, Greg, to your point, where maybe they, they don't have the words to articulate it. They've probably got the words to put something on the website that you can maybe help them the first time tie these pieces together. Oh, I see from your website, you're committed to helping, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and that maybe you have some ideas behind it so they can start connecting those dots and thinking more meaningfully about that. The other thing that jumped out to me was you're asking a question that I really like, which is what is the problem you're trying to solve for? Mm -hmm. And I think if you get in a, into a situation where no one is really coming up with anything, you could almost skip to that third column and start talking about the problems they're trying to solve for. Um, and back your way into some of the rest of it. As, um, as the human that talks to the developers, I'm just super glad you, you wrestled yourself to the ground on important dates. So we don't get like, I would like 72 date fields that could be done. I'm like, hey, look, Matt, you must've pushed back on this one and gotten <laughs> Greg down. Like, maybe you could just talk about one. <laughs> as the sales guy, I just want the date to be tomorrow and for it all to be delivered then. So if we could just do that, that'd be okay. <laughs> The other thing that I really like about Greg's wish list is when you're working with smaller customers and they don't have a maturity level with their business, they don't really know how to articulate organizational goals. But if you ask them, what is your wish list that they get? Yeah. Friendlier. Yeah. Yeah, because they probably got they have the hint of a business plan, but they might not have it written out to your point where that feels very formal, almost scary to them of like, oh, they get that imposter syndrome all over again. Like, <laughs> yeah, I already didn't think I could grow this business. And now I really don't think I can. <laughs> it's fun to watch the evolution of the topics evolve, sometimes within the single meeting, other times over multiple meetings yesterday we met with a customer and there was the owner and their finance person on the call and the finance person is a little bit more junior and there was a goal that they were talking about moving to the cloud and specifically one of their products and the owner asked the finance person you know when will we be done with this goal for the software yeah. and you could see the effort to how fast can i get this done what's the soonest date i should give and she gave a date and everybody kind of paused and knew that was aggressive. And fortunately, give credit to the owner. He's not somebody who's trying to push for a date. And he pushed back and says, is that really realistic? And it evolved. 
And by writing it down this way, it's helped to evolve into real goals and real uh, numbers, budgets or dates or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's a fun exercise to walk through with customers by just writing it down this way. I wonder, you know, at one point the wish list, like the wish is lined out and put like the reality list, but like we've now, <laughs> you know, like we've grown up, like you, this was all a dream before, but now we've all kind of gotten to a place where this is a, uh, this is reality. So well done, you know, like you're patting them on the back for that. Yeah. So Greg and I were both on this call yesterday and Greg was using this format, um, driving the conversation. And I was in the background off screen using the LCI goals list. And that specific goal, the high one was we want to get our server to the clouds, so everything to the cloud. And so we'd kind of written it that way as the big goal. But what the reality was, we had to start peeling back the onion. And I was kind of using the tasks within the tool because I was just testing it a little bit. Yeah. QuickBooks needs to go to the cloud. Well, what's the date of that? This other critical software, what's the date of that? And it started to break it out for us, um, which is like the evolution too of this, this process for us. I'm wondering how often, especially with the less mature clients, you find that they, because it, especially listing at wish list, I think this can be, a, this can help them get there. Starts with tactical. You actually teach them how to make it strategic and then you can get back to tactical, but they don't know all of the tactics, right? They're like, oh, I wish I didn't have to plug things into the wall. <laughs> and you're like, okay, so is that because you wanna be able to work remotely or work in different locations? And when they, you help them get there, then you can back it up to, we've got to do QuickBooks, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I will also say that when we first begin um, working with organizational goals, a lot of this comes from conversations and questions that I'm asking. And sometimes when we're presenting organizational goals and technology alignment, I'm actually writing what those organizational goals are for them because they don't necessarily understand how to articulate it to me. So, you know, I, I ask them, you know, very leading questions and spend a lot of time with them, asking them questions. And then when we meet for our first uh, uh, review, um, we call them um, strategy reviews. We don't call them QBRs. Um, so when we, when we meet for that first review, I'll say, remember we talked about this and here's how I formatted it for you. You know, are we, do you agree? and you know, what's missing and, um, and those kinds of things. So I'm often kind of building that for them the first couple of times, but once they see what they've said kind of getting written down and, and put into that table, then it clicks for them and they're a lot, it's a lot easier for them to have those conversations then. Uh, um, yeah, it was better than I thought. <laughs> the, 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 the other thing that resonates to me is now when you meet with your client, they're looking forward to what you're going to bring back to move the needle on a strategic initiative, or even just to show them something new that's a, a an improvement on their business. Mm -hmm. Instead of them focusing on if Trisha's coming to meet me, she wants to sell me something. I probably don't want to have that meeting, right? Those are two very different, yeah, and uh, other, gut feelings when you try and schedule a meeting with me. Yeah, and the other piece on that, if um, if you look at that, you'll see there's not a whole lot of technology talk there. Yeah, yeah at all. So it's a conversation that a business owner can understand and be comfortable with. You know, some of our, our customers just don't even know that they should move their servers up into the cloud, you know, but they do know that they're going to be opening a new office in Florida in the next six months. And, you know, we know that 2012 is going end of life. So, wow, what a perfect opportunity. Let's get you moved to the cloud. This is going to make you scalable. It's going to move, you know, from capital expenses over to operating costs for you. And, it, you know, so we can kind of have those business conversations that they understand better than the technology conversation. Make so, it sound so easy. It's frustrating. <laughs> so, so when we did our um, policy and procedure writing workshop with Brian Blakely and Matt Lee, one of the things that they hammered home on both days of that workshop was your policies should be written in the language of the business. And I think you've done a good job of that here, right? You're writing their goals in their language. So it's not Azure AD migration, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff that they wouldn't understand. It's, it's written in, in, in the language that they use when they run their business. I think that's important. 
I have a question and Matt, maybe you'd be good to answer it. Although it goes along with what Trisha just said, you know, in the platform, we've got goals, which you can create tasks and you can associate recommendations, contracts. One of the things that we're adding is the ability to create a template. So I'm curious if Trisha, you have a bank of these statements or if Matt, you were thinking like, I'm going to repeat the same thing over and over again. We're going to have QuickBooks on all of them. So wouldn't it be nice to have a goal template of moving to the cloud that that you know you could repeat and delete things out of does that make sense do you already have a template of goals what does that look like for each of you not necessarily so um <laughs> so when we actually created this you know we worked with you guys to have custom reports done so this kind of spits out as part of um when we go through report builder it spits this table out and in it it spits out examples. And one is around um, uh, modern infrastructure and the other one might be around availability or, or, or security or, or something like that. So we have a couple of examples on these. Um, and you know, right now we're just going back in and well, what did we talk about last time and making sure that we're manually filling that in. I would love to not have to do that going forward <laughs> yeah that, i mean that is on the list of like okay, yeah cool yeah templated matt and your work through there do you see value in that idea i think my honest response is i'm probably too immature with driving this conversation to start to know what would be the goals that i would foresee repeating yeah. uh, from a template to know how much value there is there <laughs> um, yeah i think our thing is the the facilitation of the conversation with the customer to help them drive it out is the part that uh, we're still so focused on how to have that right conversation. Uh, Arnie, I think there's a big difference too. Are we creating a bank of business goals or a, a bank of technology goals? Because I see that there is worth it. it, it there's worth in having a list of what are the 10 to 20 strategic business goals that every business might have, improve productivity, yeah. increase security. Yeah. That's, I, was, I was looking at Trisha's left-hand column here, right? Improve business yeah. differentiators and customer peace of mind. Now you've got a chief SOC 2 compliance, right? But there might be other pieces there, improve, you know, um, better reporting, et cetera. Yeah. So my thinking was that there was a bank that folks could choose from. Uh, first, it does two things. It helps MSPs that, that haven't even started having the conversation, get some baseline of I mean, even our blank yeah. agenda in there where folks say like, right, I should ask if they're growing or shrinking or going like these types of conversations for folks that have just had technical ones may help elevate everybody's business, but then also like ease of use. If you know you're going to recommend moving to the cloud and that's associated to the same business goal of flexibility and more work remote time, et cetera. Um, I was just curious, you know, what, what those might look like. Especially if an MSP is verticalized, right? If you're if you work mostly in restaurant and hospitality, then you're probably doing cloud-based scheduling and employee apps and stuff like that that you're going to use over and over and recommend those to your customers and say, "Hey, your business would be better if," and they'll yeah. go, "Oh yeah, that should be a goal of ours," and kind of follow you along. Do you guys yeah, find I that you influence the goals heavily, or are you working hard to shut up and pry it out of them? Both. Okay. I agree. <laughs> both in the beginning. And again, it depends on the maturity of the business. So a business that's been around a little bit longer, they know this, I ask them, and they're just going to tell me like, as you can see, this is an example of an organization that's mature. So they know exactly what it is, you know, understanding, you know, how do I, I make myself uh, introduce a differentiator in my business that other people in my vertical might not have, you know, and that whole peace of mind, um, it, you know, that's something from a more mature other companies, what you're going to find are going to probably fall into three categories. It's going to be availability, efficiency, or security. Um, so, so those are the three buckets that you're going to see that things probably fall into and availability just means that they have a modern infrastructure and things aren't going to break and go down. So what needs to be put in place in order to achieve that availability? I've had customers that say to me, um, I don't care about security. 
all I care about, you, you know, we make garbage cans. Like if they steal our plans, it's a garbage <laughs> can, <Right. laughs> you know, so they don't care But what they need to make sure is that their manufacturing is up and available and it, it's not stopping manufacturing. So I know they need security in order to achieve availability. But now I know what their priority yeah. is. Yeah. So I, can, I know how to put that together and have a conversation with them about security. Greg, I want to steal your screen for just a minute because I, this, a couple of things you all had talked about um, reminded me of this. So, so maybe you know Maslow's hierarchy, right? So that is, um, you know, we, we all require food, then safety, then belonging, right? Before you can get to the better version of yourself. You know, now I joke that this is what the kids today need. They need Wi-Fi first before <laughs> they're, right? Um, but then there's also the technical hierarchy. So Trisha, this is exactly what you said, right? Like for the most part, like it's got to work. I <laughs> plugged in functioning. Then they start looking for security. Then they start, you know, like, but, the, but there may be places where that availability security component, you know, as you just said, they might have higher priorities, but I think this is also an interesting way to talk about each of the components, right? Like your wish list is way up here and we haven't even addressed this. So are you good if we go after this and then like, but we don't have MFA on anything. So the whole foundation can crumble. Um, so anyway, Greg, you can put your screen back on, but that just, I just presented this last week and, uh, and it reminded me of it the way Trisha was talking about them. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. I agree. Uh, Trisha mentioned those three, the, the triangle of priority that she talks about. I'm borrowing that now too, but uh, <laughs> the three again were availability, security, and efficiency. Yeah. And the reason for those is, um, and it's funny too, because I'll talk with the customer and they'll be like, ah, you know, security is top of mind because I can't get ransomware and have it shut me down. And I'm like, okay, so you're actually more worried about availability than you are security, right? It just happens that security plays into availability into, you know, trying to get them. But then we have other customers right now. We have a lot of customers that have no offices, have no intention of going into office, but they have all of these cloud-based applications and they keep adding more and more and more and their processes are all over the place and they're no longer efficient because they've put so many of these different things in place that now they need to kind of whittle that down and what is the right tool for my organization and how are those that going to fit into the processes that we have in place. So those efficiencies, um, you know, that's one of the things where they might be more focused on efficiency than they would availability because cloud-based applications, for the most part, you don't have to worry about availability and you don't have to worry as much about how it's secured, right? You want MFA, single sign-on, and that's it. But how, how does, everybody who now work together and work within the applications. And that's kind of where the efficiency comes in. Or even some of the things that it was on Greg's wish list there kind of fit into that whole efficiency place too. So if they're telling you that they wanna implement time clocks for payroll, right? They want to be, they don't want people to have to walk over and punch it. Like they should be able to do it some other way. That fits right into efficiency. They, they want that process to be more efficient. And, um, and you can take every single one of these and you can put that into one of those buckets right there. You know, well, go having to bounce back and forth, right? At the beginning of a business, you could easily overprice them on security, <laughs> you know, before they're even out of the gate. Um, if yeah. they, they like, I have to lock down everything first. You kind of have levels of like, we got to get you to here, efficiency, you know, and kind of bubble up. Yeah, I had asked you, Tricia, if you take that poll initially of where do you fall between the three, how often do you repeat that assessment? And I thought your answer was interesting. You said you don't repeat it because now as you work through things, you're going to have a sense of when that has shifted. You're going to know. Like I had a client who constantly was talking about availability. They finally purchased servers that were uh, younger, finally, after a <laughs> long time. Uh, they no longer had concerns about that. And suddenly now, every time I meet with him, the most important thing to him is security. I wouldn't have to resurvey him to know that. It's very clear. Yeah. 
And I do survey. So as you know, part of that conversation and when I meet with uh, customers for the first time as part of our onboarding process, we don't have anybody technical in that meeting. So the account manager might be in that meeting, um, but there's nobody technical because we want to make sure that the customer understands what the focus is and that's the business. And I will ask them, um, I want you to prioritize for me, how does availability, security, and efficiency prioritize that for me? What's most important for you? Because that really gives me kind of a, a sense of where they're at. And you can always ask why, um, you know, why did you choose those and uh, what, you know, those kinds of things. But during that during that whole conversation, I might ask six somewhat technically related questions. Well, not even six, um, maybe three or four. So what's your standard for life cycle management? Oh, you don't have one? What do you think it should be? Here's what the industry standard is, yeah. right? <laughs> so I'll tell you why you're wrong, but go ahead and tell me what you want. <laughs> yeah you can't budget for them if you don't understand their life cycle management um where's your protected data stored like where where does that exist and how do you manage access to that you know that tells me a lot about where an organization is and then what's your most critical infrastructure and why you, you know that's really important to understand because that also kind of um gives you an understanding of you know, where the business is at and where you need to focus on for them. So there's this point when you're learning a new language where you can understand it, but you can't quite speak it. Trisha, you make me feel that way all the time where it's like, <laughs> I know I can ask these three questions, but I don't know if I can do it. Like I understand it, uh -huh. but there's a maturity there of having done it for a while and understanding why and what you're asking for. That's hard to imitate. Um, the point that you brought up that I think is important too is this wish list was born out of trying to redesign our customer onboarding. And mm -hmm. you mentioned it's important to do this up front. And I just want to you know, reiterate, this is way more valuable in the first time you sit down during that onboarding to make sure you make time for this. We've had a couple of clients where we didn't make time for it. And it's a lot harder to get started once you missed that first, that first gate check to say, I'm going to expect you to think like this. It really sets that tone early. Um, while wish list is a friendly thing, it's also much more chaotic, I think. It's not as, as fine-tuned to exactly what we're looking for. And so we get a big variety of things. Uh, the first few up top are maybe automation projects that they've potentially identified, which helps because that's something that we try to go after in our market. The, you know, the remodel, my IT manager's desk is covered in crap that's been piled up there during our remodel. It had nowhere else to go. I don't know exactly how that would show up as a goal, but it is meaningful to me because I know I can make that guy's life better if we figure something better out for that. And you get down further and it's more starting to sound like goals down here, like we want to go serverless. I've been trying to tease out some sort of hierarchy that says a goal, a wish, a recommendation, project, an opportunity, a ticket, like there's something that all of them share and there's something different about each of them. I still don't know what that clean flow is. So it's, it's a bit messy, but ultimately I'm really happy when I've made the time for this because I find myself coming back to this as proof of ammunition for why I'm giving the advice that I'm giving during a recommendation. Yeah. So I don't think there's any customer that we have that I would not recommend going serverless unless there's, there's a few where they have enough people where it makes sense to have a domain controller on site. Um, there's manufacturing organizations or you know people that are working with CAD or, or, or something like that where they really need to have on-premise resources for them just for productivity and efficiency reasons. But if it's not that, I'm, I'll just tell customers up front that there's literally no more reason for them to have servers anymore. Just, you, you know, you cannot put in a data center like Microsoft Azure has. Like you can't do it. You can't do it. And so, you know, 
as I think is, is part of me being a partner and a strategic advisor for them, you, you know, that's my job is, and I'm not doing them a uh, good service if I'm not telling them that they should service anymore. So when we talk about availability, you know, in modern infrastructure, modern infrastructure means you're up in the cloud. So that's, that's kind of how we focus uh, and we talk to customers about that. My one thought, Greg, when you said one of the pieces is what is inspected is what is expected. So if you don't set the stage at the beginning that you are going to have this conversation, you're right. You know, it's like you hire your painter to do one particular project. Then he comes back later and says, well, what I really want to talk to you about is I like building decks. And you're like, wait, what? I like... We weren't, we weren't, I, I just need the bathroom done, right? So you can't, that is way oversimplifying it. But if they're not, if they're thinking they were just hiring you, even if they knew they were getting managed services, if it in their mind, they are in a break fix mentality, I think this conversation shifts and they really stop thinking break fix when they understand business solution. I was on a podcast yesterday where the question was like, what was an eye opener to you coming to this space from a different world? And I said, like, sorry, Alex, I knew him for 25 years. And literally I would say, wait, if you asked me what Alex did, I would say, he's an IT guy, right? Like, and that was so under like, well, I should I mean, the, have the conversation that started this company was you do something with computers, right? That, yep. That's, that's where it started, right? That is and where it so, started. Yeah. And, yeah. and my answer yesterday was, this is not a, like, everybody solves the problem with technology, but in fact, I believe managed service providers are business consultants. Um, and I think this just highlights it, but getting this conversation, be it a wish list or goals out in front, highlights that tremendously. Like the value on the team is so much higher than just like, hey, I've got some broken things and I wish... I didn't have a server closet. You know, like it's just a different. It's a different level. I can even see some of this being valuable in prospecting and new sale, right? As you're as you're talking to a new customer, you ask these questions anyway. What's broken in your business? What are you trying to solve for? Why did you call me? What's the other guy not handling for you? Right? That's not very far from uh, what what's on your wish list that's not being taken care of, and what are your end goals for that? Right. And I think if, if I had structured it better at my MSP, there would have been a logical way to take it from the, the prospect, from the first time you meet with them, all the way through to the 27th quarterly business review, where you're continuing to iterate that same thing. And like Marnie said, it's easier to bring it back to the table than it is to, inter to introduce it the first time way down the road. And I, I really think customers are looking for that level and they have been, um, I would say when Windows 7 went end of life, we gained so many customers because their IT person had not told them ahead of time they were gonna to have to buy 40 new computers. And it immediately changed <clears throat> the conversation to, I want somebody who's strategic, who partners with me um, and who can you know, provide this information to me. And I, I honestly, there was a complete shift out in the marketplace. And for us to be able to say that, yeah, well, this is just part of our managed services. Of course we do this. Um, you know, and we're doing the same thing. We're already working on Windows, you know, Windows 11 for our customers right now and making sure that their environments are ready, that, you know, workstations are ready, that training's been put in place and, you know, being able to be strategic uh, with customers is really important. And I really think Windows 7 was a big eye opener for a lot of customers who are looking for this type of thing. Patricia, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? So I've, <laughs> I've got my plan to go in front of a customer. Uh, two weeks ago, I sat down in front of a relatively newer client, CFO's first time sitting in the meeting. Prior to that, we were in front of a, like an office manager. So it's mm -hmm. a big step for us to move up in that client where we should be. And I said, how are things going? Getting ready for the strategic goals conversation. Tell me about what's changed in your business over the last three months. And the first thing the CFO says, I don't see what that has to do with IT. And I stumbled and I, so when you get somebody who doesn't think that the strategic conversation needs to happen with their IT department, what kind of things do you do to help with that? Or do you avoid it upfront already? 
So I just tell them that I cannot make good recommendations around technology if I don't understand what's happening with the business. Because I can, you know, hey, this device is end of life and we're going to replace it. But if you're planning on adding 20% of staff, that device might not have the capacity and you're just going to have to buy a new one in two years. And, and that's kind of how I explain the business conversation is um, you're going to, you know, you're going to potentially overspend if we don't have a good idea of what's happening within your organization. You're not going to be happy. We're not going to be happy and we're not going to have a partnership. Yeah, I think, uh, Greg, if I were you in that situation, my response would be there are three things that enable this company that, that support everything this company does, right? You build a product, you sell a service, you do something that generates cash. The three things that support you generating cash are people, process, and technology. Mm -hmm. I can't use technology to make your people more effective at their processes if I don't know what the hell's going on. I like the way. I I'm think I did it. ultimately give an answer that <laughs> approach to those things. It was definitely not that well said. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, that doesn't happen often, so we were clearly taken <laughs> off guard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Greg, you had mentioned um, the wish list. Sometimes you end up with sort of some wild card things. And I had two thoughts on that one. Um, you might get something that is truly not IT related, right? But you know how if there's a stress in your own mind, like you lost a hundred dollar bill and like that is all your brain is like, is it in my pocket now, right? And you're trying to have another conversation as you're like patting yourself down, looking in things um, that sometimes just having chapstick. that conversation. It's not a hundred dollar bill. It's oh. chapstick. If I lose the chapstick. <laughs> you know, I know where mine is too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that um, that gets some things off the plate that maybe clears the t sets the table for a strategic conversation only because you documented it and they can just mark it down. But also two books come to mind. One is Go Giver. So I think when you mention one of these pieces, like it's not something you could have solved for them, but there is maybe where you can make a connection to another business, right? Or a, another referral where suddenly you're like, oh, wow, you know, they, they had a connection to something that would solve that problem differently. And the book Go-Giver is very much um, a philosophy that, that I know Alex and I both appreciate, right? If you just do good, um, good will, will come type of thing. The other one is the book Getting Naked by Patrick Lencioni. So make sure you put his, you know, name behind that when you Google it. Um, that book. But, <laughs> but, it, but it is really very much about being open to that conversation. And if they need to get it off the plate, you're like, you know what, I'm here to consult on business. And if that's the stress we need to talk about to get to the darn server conversation, then we're gonna do it. <laughs> Point. I'll put those titles in the chat in case anybody wants them. I have to, I have One to thing I didn't mention it. about the urgency category, I originally had done high or low or medium and it wasn't really meaningful. Um, and so I ended up switching it to ABC and it's just, does this need to be done? Does this want to be done? Or is this just like an idea it could be done? And I found that that ended up being easier to do an intake with and it still has some sort of meaning in prioritization. So the top is needs, then wants, then could? Yeah. Yeah. You guys have been quiet. If you've got questions, by all means, get them out there because uh, these guys are well, way more dialed in than me than I ever was with this. Well, I really like it. It's, it's a lot to uh, think about, and I, I really think it's a, a good idea. So, to that point, you know, like the only way to eat that elephant is one bite at a time. So, yeah. what is the first step in this? Within, let's start with an existing client. Right. If we haven't been doing the business review and we haven't hit this, what would I have some thoughts, but I want to hear Trisha's and Craig's and Matt's thought. What would be the first thing you could do to start this? So I think, you know, having checking conversations with the customer and, and starting off with, you, you know, just tell them up front, we'd like to partner with you better. And we think having a better understanding of your business is going to make us more valuable to you. So we'd like to have a conversation. I have a few questions that, you know, I'd like to go over with you and uh, to, to see if we can't help build a better roadmap for you. Yeah, I can tell you. From our experience, we 
succeeded at this because we started it in our onboarding process before the customers already put you in a box and you know they're showing up trying to make you like them as much as you're trying to make them like you so everybody's on their best behavior and it was a chance for me to say yeah we do this i'm going to ask you these questions and then they answered it and then i built that confidence to then go do it with clients who maybe weren't already familiar with that process sorry Dan. but where we i think stumbled a little bit in the beginning was we tried to have these conversations the first time we went through and and tried to deliver a review and it was too late because we couldn't take any recommendations we couldn't take anything that we wanted to talk to them about and show them why their business is needed at. And so we did have to go back and readjust our process about a year ago and make sure that we were really adding this into the onboarding process because we weren't doing it. And we were trying to have the conversation later on during our first um, meeting with them. And it, we just, we weren't, we weren't getting good feedback from them at all. So I spent a lot of research online and from a business consultant perspective, what does a business consultant go in and what kind of questions do they ask um, when they go in to talk to an organization? And I did a lot of research on that and kind of formulated the questions that I asked based on that and then put it right into the onboarding process. That's an interesting statement because early on for us, when we onboarded a new customer, we always tried to schedule that first advising meeting like 90 days out because we were under this impression we had to figure out everything we could about the customer so we could give them good recommendations. Then it turned out, and we were always so afraid we we're going to not be prepared to fill up an hour's worth of information. <laughs> and every meeting ended up taking like two hours. And yeah. then we started to finally learn we've got way too much information for them. So now let's just have that meeting as quickly as possible. And we can tell them we don't know anything about you because we're still researching it. So we need you to tell us what is important to you, which kind of leads into this whole thing. Mm -hmm. In your onboarding, do you ask them how they currently budget? Yes. That was also an epiphany moment for me. Like, I'm always trying to make sure our budgeting is better and it's always imperfect. And I'm always like, I mean, it's good. It's worth looking at, but it's not perfect. And then I started asking our onboarding clients, what do you do for budgeting today? And they're like, uh. I, I usually start by saying, do you have an IT budget? <laughs> I, I can tell you that our, a lot of our partners are giving their customers a budget for the IT section of their business. And it's the only budget those customers have for their entire business, right? And I, as the IT guy, I'd like my budget to be the best and the most detailed and the one that commands the most attention. So I get the money I want, but I'm sad when they hear, when I hear that it's the only budget they have for their entire business, but I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just what it is. I mean, they need a better accountant at that point, but um, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of value in, in bringing that to the table. I, I agree. I like the, how do you currently budget though, is a, is a great question. And I'm sure the answer is most often um, we don't, we just yeah. buy what the IT guy tells us to buy when he surprises us with it. Yeah. So Krisha, something else that's come up for us is we feel like we have a great QBR, but we feel like we're spending time and effort jumping 10 feet to clear a three foot hurdle for our clients for what they actually need. And as I was talking through with you, what you do at each of your meetings, yours is very streamlined to focus on this strategic part. It's, it's like three sections. It's this table. It's the um, recommendations that are in LCI already. And then it's the assessment. I have findings that are in. We, we do the budget too. And, and the budget. Yeah. And, and part of this, we actually kind of started doing um, how we formatted our reviews very differently. And a lot of this was conversations with Alex too, that were super, super helpful for me in the beginning. So when we started working with LCI, it kind of allowed us to rethink how we were doing it. So we used to focus a lot of time on the assessment and we don't. We spend very little time on the assessment right now. So we start off with an agenda. So it, and, and the very, very first thing on the agenda is this. 
So we want to talk to them about what's changed within the organization. And then we review this to see if this still matters to them, what needs to be added, what should be changed. The next thing that we go into is recommendations because we can, we can talk to them about, well, we have this goal, we just talked about that, and this recommendation is going to be um, how, how we get to that goal. And then we talk about budgets and, and, you know, for me right now is it's a really difficult to get customers to agree and stick to life cycle management. So when they're new customers, we spend a lot of time focusing there and saying, okay, you said five years for a workstation, we're just going to send you that quote. Is that okay? And, um, you know, and we talk about the budgets and, and all of that. Um, and then we move on to the assessments. We give them every single question and we, we probably have for our um, compliance customers, we probably have about 200 questions that we go through. There's no way that we can really do that and focus on a business conversation. So now we have all the questions and answers and how they rate and they can read that if they want to. A lot of them just turn them over to their auditors when they come in. Um, but we put a little summary in each one of those sections on what's really a high priority and what's a lower priority and why. And so we, we've shortened the amount of time that we spend um, that focus on technology risks and um, needs attention items and that kind of thing. And we spend much, much more time talking about the business and how technology enables it. So you took how long do your, do your QBRs tend to be? About an hour. Ours were regularly two hours and we've gotten it down to 60 to 90 minutes, but I'd like to see us get shorter too. I, having them want more, right? is always a, a big, right, right. But like that's a power packed hour. People can focus. Nobody's thinking like, oh, I'll just skip out for 15 minutes, right? Like in a three hour meeting, who yeah. is thinking I can take a call in the middle of that? And if you're not careful with the assessment, it, it, it I like that Trish is using that at the end. I use it earlier to establish the status quo and there's always the struggle there that somebody starts to glaze over and loses interest and picks up their phone or does something else. So um, I, I like that. Um, I'm glad to hear that it's working. Alex, other, you have, oh, sorry, go ahead. The other three questions now that I ask at the end of every single review is, did you find this valuable? Um, I might have actually gotten the other two from Greg. I'm not sure. But I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> I, and then I asked them, what didn't we talk about that you would have liked to talk about? So I can immediately let Alex and Marnie know about that. And, uh, <laughs> and then what did we talk to you? What did we present to you today that you could have done without? And right now, you know, everybody's saying this is great. I wouldn't change a thing, but I would say probably in about a year from now, we're going to start getting different answers yep, yep, um, yep. and they're going to get used to it and they're going to be much more prepared to give us those answers. Yep, yep. Yeah. The, the repeated wrap up questions, I started doing that about 12 months ago and after 12 months of doing it, people get used to it and it's no longer the polite, this was great. Thanks. It's now, oh, you're going to keep asking me this. Uh, I would get rid of this part because you know, <laughs> I want this meeting to be 30 minutes too. If I actually have this option, I don't want to talk about that anymore. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only other question I throw on there too, it's more for my sake is, is there anything for our meeting three months from now that you want to make sure is a topic we prioritize? If they already know ahead of time, then I want to know what that is. It's mm -hmm. usually a no, but the handful of times it's a yes, it's really helpful. I, That's uh, awesome. Yeah, with two minutes left, I think this has been excessively valuable. I mean, I've taken a page of notes, <laughs> so I really thank all. Does anybody, Dave, I see you've got a, your pad. <laughs> that is excellent. So um, 
Yeah, I, I thank the three of you. I mean, I, we could definitely talk on this for days for sure. Um, if anybody else has questions for them, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll type them up and tip, you know, send them out to everybody. Um, and maybe we can have a follow-up conversation. Alex, any, any wrap up on your end other than big thanks for Matt Greg? No, I, I just want to extend some thanks because you guys have, uh, have taken what was, you know, my mediocre process at my MSP and helped us build a platform that has really grown and improved it as, as we go. And here we are, what, gosh, almost three years in, and you guys are still helping us really move the needle and learn what we can do better or different. So it's awesome. It takes a village and I appreciate it. So I, I want to tell you, we have we have made an offer and have accepted yeah. someone that will be a, yes, a customer success manager. And I said to him, let me be clear, <laughs> like the company mm -hmm. is not the humans that work here. It also includes our nearly 600 partners. So you have to make all of them feel that it is part of the company because they, I believe they are part of the company. So your job is not to make me happy or Alex happy, although that will help you on the day to day, right? Like it's so... Uh, so as you see new names come across in support tickets or in emails, um, they've been told, <laughs> we said specifically, don't let Greg Webb give all of the enhancement requests, but, <laughs> but, but you do at least have to give him a polite answer. <laughs> um, well, we don't have to worry because Kyle will get in there too. He's not here to defend himself, but I'll throw Spooner under the bus. He'll get his enhancement request in there too. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but we have said like that is what we feel like the culture of the company is that it's not just us. Um, we just appreciate that we don't have to pay salaries to everybody else too so <laughs> <laughs> no I, thanks thank for so thanks for bringing this to the to the table mark you've got a pretty good topic that i think we might want to expand on i might reach out to you to talk about that on the side and uh thanks everybody i, I appreciate it. it was i think this is one of our better uh sessions so yeah appreciate you bringing it take care